Welcome to the City Impact Church podcast. Join us weekly to listen to sermons from our Sunday services or our special events. For more information, visit cityimpactchurch.com or find us on our Facebook page. We pray you'll be inspired and challenged by this week's message. I don't know whether you're here this morning or not, but uh, as you know, we've got well over 100 people over in Israel right now. Uh, you saw the photos, they baptized 40 in the River Jordan and just the day before yesterday. They're going into Jerusalem to, today and tomorrow. You can imagine Pastor Tim riding in on that camel, can't you? And uh, enough to say after that, this week, this coming week, um, we've got about 50 leaving for Turkey. Some of them are there already going around the seven churches. Israel, the Middle East, of course, is steeped with uh, the Bible. Uh, in fact, over on the North Shore, we got people in the church there from Egypt, uh, which, of course, is uh, mentioned in the Bible a lot, and uh, people in the church from Iran and Iraq, and uh, those nations, of course, the whole Middle East. Interesting, of course, Israel is only the size of Canterbury. I'm talking about uh, you know, down by Christchurch, it's just a, the size of that province, Canterbury. It's not a very big uh, country at all, Israel. And yet, of course, the whole world is, is focused on that. Jerusalem, there's been more wars fought over Jerusalem than any other city. And, uh, you know, Napoleon even wanted it. Everybody wanted it uh, because there's something significant about it. It's like the center of the earth. Amen. And so this morning I was talking about uh, how God said in the last days, I will raise up the tabernacle of David. And uh, you had to be here, and I was impressed. It was, it was a Coralie, your notes, I was very impressed. Um, and uh, she's got better notes than what I've got on this, you know. But enough to say, God said I would raise up the tabernacle of David. A lot of people don't know what that is, but the ta word tabernacle basically means dwelling places. And uh, he didn't say he'd raise up the tabernacle of Moses, which was very significant in the Old Testament. There's 14 chapters, 14 chapters on the tabernacle of Moses, only two on creation. And so the incredible thing is this tabernacle of David was just a tent pitched on the hill of Mount Zion with the Ark of the Covenant. Now, most people know the Ark of the Covenant from Indiana Jones. Amazing how Hollywood get it right, even before Christians get to understand the Bible. I was saying to some young people upstairs, just to give you a thought tonight, I was just driving over here. And as I mentioned, you know, uh, the devil hates water. Uh, he hates water. Why? Because I believe he was imprisoned in water in the earth when he was cast down and locked in like the Ice Age. You know, they found dinosaurs, of course, with food still in their mouths. And so the earth was instantly frozen like that. And, um, you know, like Superman, right? Hollywood Superman. Remember, frozen the ice? I think there's another one of those super dudes too, frozen the ice. And of course, you know, the Bible says that the last days, uh, Satan's prison will be fire. And this earth is going to be melted with fire. And so this earth could become again, uh, I, I know all the greenies won't like it, but could become again the prison of the devil. Uh, and God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Praise God. So the thing is, is that um, as Satan was cast down, you know, there was an instant freezing of the earth and he was locked. And so when God came along, said, let there be light, light melts the ice, right? And so light, and he was the light. The sun, our sun wasn't given to the fourth day. I've talked about it this morning and I'm just giving you some idea. So if you weren't here this morning, you can watch the podcast because it's very fascinating that God, of course, created our sun as we know it on the fourth day. And I talked about how a day unto the Lord is a thousand years and how Jesus came in four days, 4,000 years from the fall of Adam, which is a very significant event on the calendar. And God has got his timetable. God has got his day, right? And I was just accumulating it uh, this morning just to give you some idea and so you can listen to it. And of course, in 1867, Mark Twain, whose real name was Samuel Clemens, which Samuel means the Lord hears and Clemens means the Lord is graceful, which uh, the Lord is be merciful, which is a cry of the Israel people. Lord, hear our prayer and be merciful. In 1867, Mark Twain, the non plume named Mark Twain, visited Israel and made a declaration, which was a prophecy that Moses wrote many, many years ago, how a stranger would come to a land and declare the land desolate and without inhabitants. And that's what Mark Twain did. He declared the land desolate and without inhabitants. But God said when a man, when a stranger came to the land and declared that, that would be the beginning of the restoration of Israel. Well, of course, a Jubilee is 50 
years, which is very significant in the Bible. You've got to know your Bible, church. Uh, 50 years and 50 years after 1867, you come to 1917. 1917, Lord Arthur Balfour made the Bellflower Declaration in, the, in World War I. And he declared uh, that the Ottoman people would no longer have the rule over Israel, that the Jewish people could have their land back in 1917, which is a very significant year. Uh, 50 years after that, in 1967, because they got the land back, but they didn't get Jerusalem back. In 1967, there was a six-day war. It was an absolute miracle. Fighting against Israel was four nations, Egypt, I, I, Iran, uh, Iraq, sorry, Jordan, and Syria. And uh, four nations against one little nation. Amazing. And yet they won a war without firing a shot. It was an absolute miracle in 1967, 50 years after that jubilee. And then, of course, as I mentioned, to accumulate it, 50 years after 1967, you came to 2017. And a man called Donald Trump in the first year of his office, just like Cyrus of the Old Testament, in the first year of his office, declared that the nation would go back and rebuild the temple. If you know anything about King Cyrus, who was prophesied, I know I've just lost you, but prophesied in the Old Testament, 150 years before he was born by the prophet Isaiah, that a king would arise by the name of Cyrus, a heathen king, and declare uh, that they would, uh, his people would go back and rebuild the temple after 70 years of captivity. That's exactly what happened, right? And so Donald Trump, of course, declared Jerusalem to be the capital of Israel to the outcry of the world in his first year of office. They say it was actually the same day as Cyrus did that declaration as well. And so all that is fascinating. And of course, 1948 is a very important date. 1947-48 was November 47 and flipped into 1948 when Israel uh, was made a nation again, when England gave Israel to be its own nation. And so after 70 years, 2017, 70 years of captivity and so forth, of course, you came to 2017. And so we're going to be following on from that in a couple of weeks' time, talking about the restoration of all things, because God says he'll restore all things, right? And so he's into restoration. I know that I lost a lot of you right now, but enough to say that's what I was talking about this morning. A little bit different to what I normally would talk about on a Sunday, because the teams in Israel right now, it's a very significant uh, situation that's happening. I don't know whether you're aware but right now around the world, I know many of you would know the riots that are in Hong Kong, horrendous riots, and you know the world is in uproar. But did you know in Iran right now there's huge riots? Did you know that? Huge riots over there. Uh, I mean, England is a mess. Hello. <laughs> Do you know anything about England? Scotland, Scotland is just in a riot right now, wanting, wanting, wanting to have independence and so forth, so forth. And, uh, you know, then you got the whole march for, for, for um, um, you know, the earth. And uh, are you aware of what's happening out there? So it's interesting days in which we live. I'm excited about the day in which we live because God said he's going to do a quick work. Amen where the reaper will overtake the sower, and, and so many other scriptures, where the glory of the latter house will outshine that of the former. And so we're talking about all those things. And so I was talking about this tabernacle of David. And so the tabernacle of David had one piece of furniture in it, had the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God, the glory of God. He said, I will meet with you on the mercy seat between the, the wings of the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. That was what Indiana Jones was looking for. Remember that? I thought, I thought I'd tell you that. So in any case, so tonight I'm going to talk about bringing the ark back to the, <laughs> to the city. Is that all right? Yeah. So all that was just a prelude, just to give you a bit of an, uh, you know, because I saw Carly's notes, I got so inspired, I thought I'd better preach it. In any case, all right. So 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. I won't be so deep tonight, don't worry. And you'll be home in time to watch the game. Amen. So Again, in 2 Samuel 6, verse 1, Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. David arose and went with all the people who were with him uh, to Baal Judea to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called the name, uh, by the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubims. I've just explained that to you. And we had pictures this morning of the ark of the covenant and David's uh, tabernacle, which was simply a tent pinched on, on Mount Zion. And brought up from the house of Abadab, which was on the hill. And Uzziah uh, and Oah, the sons of oh, these big names, drove the new cart. They brought it out of the house, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God. 
And Ao went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord. Remember the tabernacle of David? I was just talking about it. It was 24 hours praise and worship. It was just wild praise. I talked about a 40-year period before the millennial reign where we would have wild and praise of worship in the church instead of form and tradition like Moses' tabernacle. For those who were here, you would have heard that. Uh, David on, on harps and stringed instruments, tambourines and cymbals. And then they came to uh, Nacon's threshing floor and Isaiah put his hand on the ark of God and took hold of it because the oxen had stumbled and it looked like the ark was going to fall off. And Isaiah, but you've got to remember that the ark <laughs> carried the glory of God. You can't reach out and touch God like that. I want to tell you right now, I mean, uh, you know, the Bible says even if you see His presence, obviously we're covered with the blood of Jesus and I praise the Lord for that. But you know, uh, no man has seen God and lived, praise God. You know, He's so, man, just incredible. His eyes are a flaming fire. I mean, you know, and so you might get upset, but David got upset because he died there. And David became angry of the, because of the Lord's outbreak. And he called the name of the place Perez Azar to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? Now, this is before David's tabernacle was built. So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but God, uh, sorry, David took it aside to the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. Now, hands up those who've heard of Obed Edom. I preached on Obed Edom, right? He was the one who hungered for the presence of the Lord. And it says, The Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household. In the presence of the Lord, there is life forevermore. If you, you've got to handle it right. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went up and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed to the city of David with gladness. Now listen now, they tried to bring it. On a new cart, they tried to build a cart like the Philistines did. And I don't have time to recap too much, but the Philistines had a cart. I'm going to talk about it in the restoration of David's tabernacle. And they put the ark on it. That wasn't how the ark was supposed to be carried. It was supposed to be carried on the shoulders of the priests, right? And so David got it right this time. And every six paces, they sacrificed oxen and fat and sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was wearing a linen ephod. A lot of people saying he said he was naked, but he wasn't. He was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a trumpet. Now, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. She despised him in her heart. But they brought the ark of the Lord and said in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected. Tabernacle is a tent, is, a, is that dwelling place. We're going to stop there and, and finish, the, finish the, the reading just halfway through. But we've got to understand, church, that the ark represents the, the covenant of God, the glory of God, the power of God, the majesty of God, even the very presence of God. Now, you've got to get your head around this. God created the heavens and the earth. He said, let there be and there was. We're talking about the galaxy. We're talking about numbering and naming the stars. We're talking about knowing the number of grains of sand on the beach. We're talking about knowing the number of hair upon every person's head on the planet. We're talking, and you look at the person next to you, there's not another person on the planet that's got their fingerprint. Every person is different. Even the facial feature, I find that amazing. Eight billion people, no one looking alike, and he's only got that much skin to work with. I mean, you know, you try to do that, friend. I mean, that's incredible. And you know, God created the heavens and the earth. We're talking about uh, something way beyond. Uh, you know, forget about your super dudes and uh, what's those comic book heroes? My wife likes them. Marvel, forget about Marvel and Wonder Woman and all that stuff. We're talking about God the creator of heaven and earth. Can I hear an amen to that? And so King David was a man, the Bible said, after God's own heart. And he had a huge desire to bring this ark, to bring the present. And it had been captured by the Philistines. I'm going to be talking about it next, uh, maybe the following Sunday morning. It had been captured by the Philistines. And he had a heart to go and retrieve it and bring it back to Jerusalem. But like many people, even today in many churches, trying to do it a new way, trying to do it under a new program, as it were, a new system, even the world's way, putting it on, an ark, on a card. It wasn't supposed to be carried on an ark. This is why I say, friend, we've got to know the book and we've got to do all things according to the book. Amen. Hallelujah. It's not a matter of rules and regulations. It's a matter of the pattern. God said to Moses, do it according to the pattern. There's a pattern even to the New Testament church. It's established on apostles and prophets. Can I hear an amen to that? And so he bought, you know, he, 
He thought initially that it would be so dead easy to bring the bring this ark back. And as I said, he got this cart, this new cart, but not everything new is necessarily good. <laughs> not everything old is necessarily good, by the way, either, but it's got to be God's way. And so this cart hits a pole, pothole, as I mentioned, and Isaiah dies. David gets angry and he puts it in the house of Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom, being a wise man, lets God into his house. Friend, if you're here tonight, if you don't hear anything else, if I've lost you and baffled you already, listen to me. Be wise and let God into your house. I'm talking about your dwelling place, your body. Hallelujah. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. And if you're wise, if you're smart, you'll allow God in. Why? Because He is the fountain of life. People have been searching for the fountain of youth. I want to tell you, He is that fountain. The Bible tells us that. Obed-Edom is so blessed. Everything he touched, it's like it turned to gold. He had no weeds in his garden. His lettuces took up one wheelbarrow. Think about it, one lettuce. His sheep probably needed cheering twice a week. I mean, he was so blessed. You know, the butter fat went up on the cows. The kids got home on time and made their beds. Hallelujah. His wife looked 20 years younger. Praise God. I mean, I mean he was blessed. David gets to hear about it. He says, I've got to have this ark, man. I'm hungry for the presence of God. I'm hungry for the blessing of God. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is that I have to get God, as it were, into my city. And I don't know about you, but I'm passionate to have God in the city. You know, just last night, 20,000 young people downtown, three ended up in hospital and people trampled and people worshipping the wrong kind of thing. Friend, I want to tell you, I desire to see God in my city, not just in the church, not just in these four walls, but in the city, in the shopping mall. Amen. And so David says, I've got to have the presence of God in my town. Now, since this cart episode and Isaiah and, and all that, David learned a thing or two. He probably read the book. And uh, as I said, God doesn't need any new program. It's not a system we need. It's a presence of God we need. Can I hear an amen to that? And it was always meant to be carried on the shoulders of the priest. <laughs> Have I got any priests in the house tonight? The priest isn't the guy with the microphone. That, that, that's religion for you. Where you've got the clergy and the laity. That's, that's Moses' tabernacle. We're in David's tabernacle. Amen. We're all priests unto the Lord. Did you know you're a saint? I know if you belong to the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, they wouldn't call you a saint because you haven't achieved sainthood. But I'm telling you, the Bible calls you a saint. You've got to get your doctrine right. Amen. So the New Testament, 1 Peter 2.9 says, You are you. Touch yourself and say, you're talking about me. You are a royal priest to the holy nation, a people belonging to God. And so I want to give you seven quick attributes on how we as a church, how we as priests, how we as people, as we as ministers can bring the presence of God. This is what the ark represents, the presence of God into our city. Number one, are you ready? Number one, David was hungry for the favour of God. I wonder if you're hungry for the favour of God. When you, you know, you see people living without God and, you know, often their lives are spiraling down. But I want to tell you, I've, I've lived enough, friend, to see what it's like to live under the favour of God. I got friends who don't live under the favour of God. And, you know, it's just like chalk and cheese. David did not just sit back in the palace. I know David didn't lack anything. He had a, <laughs> I won't tell you how many wives he had, but he had, he had a few things going for him. But he didn't just sit back. He was already blessed, but he didn't just sit back, friend. The Bible said it was with gladness. Yeah. With gladness, David went after the presence of the Lord. He went after the favour of God. He went after it with gladness. You know, some Christians, they need to discover gladness. I hate it when I see people walking into church looking like they're going to a funeral. Looking like they're sucking on lemons, man. I mean, you know, hello. We need to serve the Lord with gladness. You know, some Christians need to discover that God wants to bless you. I mentioned this morning, God is not a God of scarcity. He is a God of abundance. How do I know that? When Jesus fed 5,000, there were 12 basketfuls left over. They didn't even need that much bread. It happened again, seven baskets when He fed 4,000. When He got... Peter and, uh, Peter and John to catch the fish. The boats began to sink to so much fish. It was like the abundance. He came to bring you life and life more abundantly. Amen. Amen. He's an extravagant God. He puts flowers in the mountains where no man walks. Yeah. Ladies, you like flowers, don't you? Yeah. God's got mountains, valleys full of flowers that you will never ever get to see. Why put them there? Because He's a God of extravagance. 
You know, the thing is, is that the blessed gospel, I won't call it the prosperity gospel, I just call it the blessed gospel. It's not an American gospel. It's a Matthew, Mark, Luke and John gospel, right? Pressed down, shaken together and running over. And so Psalms, the book of Psalms talks about your years being crowned with favour, your paths dripping with fatness, blessing from strength to strength, from increase to increase. You know, most people like cake, right? I'm not eating cake at the moment, you might tell. (laughs) But the thing is, is that more, more people like the icing. The icing on the cake. In fact, you know, if you go to a cafe with kids, you could recycle the cakes. They just eat the icing, right? You know, I, I believe that as Christians, we need to understand that God put the icing on the cake for you and I. Life is meant to be enjoyed. Amen. Amen. And it's favour. Proverbs 11, verse 11. By the blessing of the upright. Listen now. By the blessing of the upright. Listen now. By the blessing. Listen. Are you listening? By the blessing of the upright, the city is blessed. So if you're blessed, the city's blessed. If you're not blessed, the city won't be blessed. Think about that. In other words, your city is better off when you're blessed. Wow. Number one, Dave was hungry for the presence of God. I hope and pray that you're hungry for the presence of God. I'm hungry for the presence of God. I can't live without it. It's my breath. Amen. Number two, David knew, this is how to get the presence of God back. David knew how to sacrifice. David knew how to sacrifice. Every six paces, they sacrificed an ox. That's a lot of meat right there. A lot of barbecuing. Must be Tongans. <laughs> Notice it wasn't pigs. You know that, right? So every six paces, ox and sheep. But friend is so true. <laughs> I could say in this life you get what you pay for, but I just want to say that some people think tithing is being generous. Tithing isn't being generous. I'm talking to a man out there who just read The Blessed Life and he's saying how much it changes his life with The Blessed Life book that we gave you. And it changed his world, his idea on, on tithing. It heard it all before, but it, it made sense. And so some people treat tithing like, like, like you know, curse insurance. <laughs> they think if they tell, God's not going to curse them, you know. Like people treat salvation as life insurance, you know. I'm not sure. I just want to give my life to Jesus in case, you know. Right? I mean, I understand it is that. You, you need life insurance. Assurance, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. But it's way more than that. And I worry for people who are just in because they're too scared or too afraid of the alternative. And I don't want to go to hell. Who would want to go to hell? But salvation is more than that. Salvation is about a relationship with God. It's about a relationship with God. Tithing is about obedience, about blessing. And, you know, tithing is really, I understand our obligation, but it's really entry level giving. So David understood what it's like to sacrifice. David was generous in his sacrificing. Can I encourage you as a church to be generous, to see the blessing of God on your life? The Bible's very clear. Who is generous will prosper. Proverbs 22, 9. He who is generous, who he hears a generous eye, will be blessed. Hands up those who want to be blessed. Be generous. Number three, are you with me? David was not only hungry and, 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 uh, and what else was the second one that I said? Knew how to sacrifice. He also, David was passionate. I'm sure the two teams playing in the grand final will be pretty passionate. They'll be fired up. You don't win a game without passion, right? And you won't be a full-on Christian without passion either. People who want to help bring the presence of God to town are passionate people. In fact, it's been said, if people don't know what your passion is, you probably don't have one. I mean, you know, to be honest, if I talk to any stranger, now you know I ride a Harley Davidson. For some people, the Harley Davidson is their passion. You talk with them, for Charlie, it's a Yamaha. (laughs) Could you reach out your hands towards that man right now? I mean, 
you talk to a lot of Harley Davidson riders and the first thing out of their mouth is talking about their bike, talking about the CCs. I don't even know what CC my bike is. I couldn't care less. I just jump on and ride it. I mean, I enjoy riding it, but it's not my passion. I mean, dogs, I love dogs. I've had dogs all my life. I'm thinking about getting another one. I've had big dogs, little dogs, in between dogs. But the thing is, is that <laughs> even though I love dogs, it's not my passion. I've even got a stamp collection. Not that I've looked at it for 40, 50 years. I mean, I got given to it at school, you know, when I was at school, which is how long ago now? A long time. In any case, <laughs> certainly not my passion. Some people, for G it's Jim, you know, Jim is their church. All they want to talk about is that. You know, other people say work and whatever. But whatever you spend your time, energy and money on, that is your passion. Whatever you talk the most about, that is your passion. If I'm talking to any stranger, and I, and I, and I, and I just do this naturally, I don't have, to, you know, you, you can check me out. If I'm talking to any stranger, I mean, if, he, if I'm riding my bike, he might ask me about my bike, so it might start there. But sooner or later, and Charlie and Janet will tell you, they've been with me enough, I will end up talking about Jesus. In so, or God in some way. Why? Because He's my passion. He's, he's the th very thing that I want to talk about. I can't call Him a thing, but the very person I want to talk about. I mean, you know, it's like when somebody's in love and they get engaged, right? All they can talk about, in fact, you wish they'd shut up. <laughs> All they talk about is the person they love, right? Pity they didn't do it for their whole life. My darling wife's preaching on the shore tonight. Hallelujah. Uh, but you know, when people are passionate, it's what flows out of their mouth, right? David was passionate. He danced before the Lord with all of his might. Not some of his might, all of his might. Sometimes I wish I was just younger again, had my knees like they were at 20. I'd show you how to dance a thing or two. <laughs> I said this morning I was going to do a holy roller, you know, like the holy roll. But if I get down, I probably won't get back up. But when you get to my age, if you do get down there, you think, well, what else can I do while I'm down here? Hallelujah. You wait. <laughs> Christians are not supposed to be boring. Yeah. Yeah. Nehemiah wept and mourned when he heard about the state of the city. Remember, Cyrus had declared he went and, his, and Nehemiah and, and Ezra. And when they heard the state of the city, they wept. What moves us? I wonder if the tragedies, those three people that died last night, wonder whether the tragedies that are happening in our city, the murders and the rapes and so forth, the young prostitutes, I wonder if they move us or whether we're just oblivious to them and, and say, oh, well, it's our own fault. I wonder if we care about this. Let, let's pick up verse 17. And uh, I don't have much longer to go because um, I can hear my, my, the game calling. Just kidding, I'm just kidding. So they bought the ark of the Lord, set it back in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Is it on the screen behind me? Verse 18, thank you team. When David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the woman and the men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, all that barbecue, and a cake of raisins. Wow, good deal. And so all the people departed, everyone to his own house. And David returned to bless his household. And remember Michael or Michelle, whatever, how would you pronounce her name? Michal. And Michal, Pastor Rob said that, so it's got to be right. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servant, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. She was pretty jealous. So David said to Michal, Michael, Michelle. What did you say? That's what I said the first time. Oh, I'm glad Bev's not here. <laughs> She'd slap someone. Probably me. It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me rule over the people of the Lord. Remember, her father was Saul, right? First king of Israel. I mean, there's a whole deal in that. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, <laughs> like my preaching at times. And I'll, but I'll be humble in my own sight. It's like Moses. He wrote, he was the most humble man in the world. Imagine writing that for yourself. 
The Apostle John wrote, the disciple who Jesus loves, he wrote it five times in his book, talking about himself. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honour. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. You know, my point number four is David blessed others. David blessed others. He gave them all a cake. He gave them a piece of bread. He, gave them, he had other people in mind. I could talk about the pantry right here, right now, right? Hello. You know, I think a lot of us can bring in something to help somebody. Jesus said, the poor you'll always have among you. And we're here to help people, not to give them a hand out, but a hand up, help them through their time of need. And when I heard, you know, that some people are going to school, some kids without lunch in the lunch, but I said, this is not good enough. We can all do something about this. Now, as a church, we always help people, you know, when they're shifting house or, or when they've just had a baby or sick in hospital, we endeavour to through the pastoral team. They do an incredible job and make sure that people are looked after and, and all that. But this is the pantry is not about that. The pantry is about helping people who are in need, our, the poor among us. Amen. And David had other people in mind and people who want to bring the presence of God to their city to bless other, to bless other people. You know, some people just want the presence of God for themselves. It's all about me, all about me. No, it's all about us. Amen. I want the presence of God so you'll get a miracle because in the presence of God, there are miracles. There's life forevermore. There's healings. Amen. And so David gave every one in the city a cake. In fact, as I said, two pieces of bread and a cake, one with dates, one with raisins. But our job is to bless people, not to use people. And Proverbs says a man's gift makes room for him. Talking about spiritual gifts, but it can open up doors. Hallelujah. Number five, I'm, I've only got two more. Are you still with me tonight? Is this all right? Talking about bringing the ark back. We're going to go into more details about the ark in the, in the coming week. In fact, next Sunday morning, I think I'm preaching here. I'm going to talk about Moses' tabernacle and the way into the presence of God, which led into this morning, but I'm doing it in reverse over here. And then the following week, I'll follow on part two of David's tabernacle. Is that all right? So David, point number five, was not intimidated. Not intimidated. He could have been intimidated. I mean, you know, obviously this girl, Michelle, Michelle, Michelle Michael, my, you know, this woman, she was a pretty looking woman. She is the daughter of a king. And uh, David could have been, but he wasn't intimidated, nor, neither should we be. Now, as I said, she wasn't happy, but you have to know who you are in God and not be intimidated by others. Because listen now, unfortunately, not everybody will rejoice when you get saved. I mean, I can remember as a 12 year old kid going home. And remember, did you see my post with my decision certificate and Bev's? That was amazing, 1963. But the thing is, both of us in the same year, one, one in Canada, one here in New Zealand. As I said, I went first. Hallelujah. I just like that point. I just got to get it in there once again. And, and, and so the thing is, is that God has got His plan, timetables and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, when I went home as a 12-year-old kid, you got to remember I went, I went wayward in my teenage years very badly because I didn't have a good church to be part of, to be planted in. I got them with the wrong crowd. I became a very wild, misspent youth, 40 job by the time I was 20. I've been around an awful lot, but too far really. But enough to say, the thing is, is that when I went home and told mum I gave my life to the Lord as a 12-year-old kid, she was not happy with me. She didn't understand it. It confused her. She was upset about it. Not everybody will rejoice when you get saved. Did you know that? Not everybody will understand and appreciate what you're doing when you give your life to Christ. Not everybody will agree with and cheer you on that you're spending your Sunday in church. You know, all my friends, when I got, uh, gave my life back to the Lord at 21 years of age, I, went, I was in Wangarei, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I went down to New Plymouth where I was from in Taranaka. I got all my friends together in the room, all my old heathen friends. I mean, I knew these people so well. We'd flattered together, lived together, drunk together. We'd done life together, right? I mean, these were my, you know, blood brothers. I got them all in a room. I told them what had happened. I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I got saved. I expected them all to fall on their knees and be, rejoice. And, you know, something had happened to Peter. They thought I was on another trip. They thought I'd taken another drug. They thought something had happened. You know, I'd flipped out. They said it won't last. Hello? 40 I don't know, over 40 de four decades have gone by. Man, I tell you. But they weren't happy. 
They didn't feel they could invite me down to the pub anymore and to their parties. I would go with them because I, I didn't want to kind of cut ties and I'd be a witness to them. But I unfortunately brought conviction to their life. I didn't mean to, but just my very presence because I carry the presence of God. And when you carry the presence of God and people, you know, are swearing in your presence, they go, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to swear, right? You know, they get all up, but they blame you for it because they're feeling uncomfortable. They just want to get on with their sinning and they don't want you around. Man, I'm a friend of sinners. I'll go anywhere with anybody. I don't, I'm, I'm happy, but I, I have discovered that a lot of people don't want me there now. I don't get invited like I used to get invited because I carry the presence of God and the presence of God convicts them of their sin. They don't want to be convicted. They're happy in their sin. Am I talking to anybody? And so not everybody will cheer you on when you come to church. Not everybody will cheer you on when they hear that you give your money to the church. <laughs> they definitely won't cheer you on because they want it. And so you've got to cope with criticism and misunderstanding. And sometimes it even comes from those within your own household. Even Jesus said, he said, you think I've come to bring peace on the earth? He said, I've come. He said, he said set husband against wife and father against, you've read the scriptures? You know, when somebody gives their life to the Lord and the other one doesn't, there's friction in the house. Did you know that? That's why you should never marry a non-Christian. Oh, it'll be all right, you think? Yeah, that side of the ring it will be. Number six, people do anything to get you into bed. In any case, number six, David knew who he was in the Lord. <laughs> David knew, I'm just giving the ladies a tip today. <laughs> David knew who he was in the Lord. Men can be very nice that side of the ring. Did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> Verse 21. Because he is confident in himself and in God. You've got to know who you are in the Lord. You've got to know that you're a saint of God, that you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Amen. You know, in Matthew 16, when Jesus said, Who do men say that I am? You know, Simon said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus turns to Simon, his name is Simon, and said, I'll tell you who you are. You are Peter the rock. Hallelujah. God will turn you from a reed into a rock. He'll make you something that is reliable and dependable. But don't lose your confidence. When God tells you who you are, when you get born again, when you realise that you're a child of God, don't lose your confidence. Don't be intimidated. Because often critics only state the obvious. 1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, holy nation, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praise of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvellous light. My last point, number seven. All right, bringing back the ark, bringing back the presence. David pushed through the boundaries of limitation. In other words, he did not let history and experience set the benchmark. You know, in other words, we haven't seen nothing yet. When I read about the Welsh revival, what happened there, the jails were emptied, the pubs emptied out. I tell you, when I read about Azusa Street, when I read about the masses of revivals in, in different countries and the way that God has moved across the earth. I just read a book, 2,000 Years of Charismatic History. It's a great book. You want to get hold of it. And you know, there's been some marvellous moves of God, but we ain't seen nothing yet. I believe there's going to be a last day's move that, 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 that blows everything else out of the water. God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Amen. And so the best is yet to come. The maids that, that Michelle, my, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny now, that M M M Michal spoke about the servant maids, not just the servants, but the maids. These were the lowest of the low. If I use that like the car system uh, of the day, these were the, <laughs> the lowest of the lows. But David said, those maids that you spoke about, with them I will be distinguished. You know, God will take the lowest person and exalt them. If you're prepared to humble yourself, He will exalt you in due time. The last will be the first. Hallelujah. You know, and the first, sometimes all those important people that you see on television, you think all those celebrities, those rock stars, I want to tell you, you know, unless they know Jesus, they're going to be last. The presence of God can set free the most captive of captives. People that are downtrodden. God has chosen the foolish of the world to confound the wise. 
people that are hurting, people that are needy. Sometimes you look at a person, you think they've got it all together, living in that big flash house, driving that nice car and so forth. But you know, you can have six fancy suits in the closet, look good on the outside, but you can be rotting on the inside. It's like the big juicy apple, you know, can be the home of 12 big fat worms. People in your city will come into blessing because you and I have helped bring back the presence of God. How do we bring it back? Number one, by hungering after it. Be hungry. I, I pray just about every day, Jesus, come back, Lord Jesus. Hope I'm not disrupting your plans to be in all black or you're disrupting your plans to get married. But, you know, Josh prayed before he went to Israel. He said, Lord, while we're in Israel, let there not be a war. I said, Josh, there are going to be some people in Israel when the war breaks out. <laughs> that was probably a good prayer to pray, but what about others? <laughs> it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But hungering, are we hungry for the presence of God? Number two, sacrifice. Do we know what it is to sacrifice? Pentecost is called plenty cost. Costs you plenty to be a Pentecostal Christian. Passion. Passion. Be in love with Jesus. Be in love with the church. Be in love with lost people. If you love those three things, you'll do well. Don't love the world or the things of the world. Nothing wrong with things. As long as things don't have a hold of you. God will bless you. God will give you things. But God will seek first the kingdom of God. Then all these other things will be added unto you. As I mentioned this morning, a lot of people, you know, they, they want God to be generous to them first before they'll be generous. No, you've got to start being generous and you'll see the blessing of God work in your life. And so hungering, sacrifice, passion, blessing other people, not being intimidated, knowing who you are and pushing through the boundary. So it's not a new program. I have a lot of people over the past 40 years say to me, oh, Peter, I've got this new idea. And I mean, I understand that. But, but friends, sometimes it's just simply a matter of doing it. One pastor said to me, what do you think God's doing on the earth? I said, the same thing he's been doing for 2,000 years, saving souls and maturing people into Christ's likeness. Amen. Yeah. And so we carry the presence of God, hallelujah, on our shoulders into our workplace. You'll go to your workplace tomorrow. I won't be there. You, the priest of God, carry the, carry the presence of God. Think about that. But if you swear like the boys and tell dirty jokes and, and all that kind of stuff, I tell you, you're not carrying the presence of God. The presence of God is holy. It's righteous. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm just talking about living a life that different. I've had people come to me, and it's not because I'm somebody special, but they just say, what is it about you? There's something different about you. I haven't said a word to them. You won't please the world. I tried that. You know, when I gave my life back to the Lord at 20, 21, I gave up everything. I gave up you know, the drugs and the drink and so forth, so forth. And people would say to me, Jesus drank wine. What's wrong with a drink? Oh, he did. I guess there's nothing wrong with one drink. The Bible says, do not get drunk. And so I went along and I'd have one drink. And then they'd turn to me and say, how can you be a Christian and drink? <laughs> I discovered I couldn't win. So I gave it up. It's just easier that way. It's a greater witness. So when I'm in presence, everywhere, not just non-Christians, but everywhere, at home or everywhere, you know, I'll have an orange juice. And often people say, why are you having an orange juice? I say, I, have, I don't drink. Really? I said, I haven't drunk for over 45 years. Really? It's like, where do you come from? Planet Strange or something? <laughs> I don't wake up with a fuzzy head in the morning. Hallelujah. Save a lot of money. Praise God. Don't get into fights anymore. <laughs> but I do it for the sake of young people. Because I want to be an example. I want to be a, a witness. I said when I first got saved, if I was, you know, sitting watching the league game tonight and you came around and what, one beer, one beer. I mean, what's wrong with a beer? It's not going to take you to hell, one beer. And I had a can of beer in my hand. What would they think? I mean, what would they think? I know what they'd think. I know how people think. 
Not hard to figure out, right? And so it's just easier not to. I certainly haven't suffered for it. I've been way better off for it. Because to be honest, and I'm talking honestly in openness with you now, if I had one, I'd probably have two. And then I probably couldn't help myself, I'd have three. And I'd be crossing a line. And by the time you get to four, you don't care. So it's just better to hold it back here. No is a great word. And so some things I do for the sake of the gospel, not because I'm a pastor or minister. I did this way before that. I did it as a Christian, as a saint. Because I wanted to be the best example I could be to other people. I didn't want to be a stumbling block to people. And so you've got to do what you, your conscience tells you. But you know, I want to encourage you to be passionate and hungry for God. And if you make God your priority, then it just everything else falls into line. Then people say, what is it about you? Why don't you drink? Well, I'll tell you why I don't drink. I used to drink. Got me into a lot of trouble. If I'd still been drinking today, I'd be a messed up person. Isn't it amazing? One drink can lead to an alcoholic's life. One drink, all it takes. Enough to say, bringing the presence of God, the ark, back to the city. That's what the ark represents to us, the presence of God. Did you know what was in the ark? I'm not going to tell you tonight. It's another message. It's three things. But enough to say, I hope and pray, my friend, that you capture just even one of those points. Maybe just lift your passion a little bit more. Maybe just knowing who you are. Maybe it's pushing through the limitations and the boundary. Maybe it's not being intimidated by other people. Whatever it is, my friend, even if you take one point tonight and just work on that, live that out this week, you're going to be a blessed person and those around you will be blessed as well because you carry the blessing of God wherever you go. Amen. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand tonight.